So, we're going to kick off. Our first speaker is Apoorva Madan. Apoorva is an animal advocate of nine years and she's a practicing clinical psychologist. During her master's in clinical psychology, she studied activism, trauma and compassion fatigue. She now does public speaking for animal rights, street outreach uh, and writing, with an aim to help the animal activist community in building their resilience, self-care, knowledge base and effectiveness. Apoorva is the author of Animal and Mind, an online blog exploring veganism and animal rights philosophy through the framework of psychology and veganism. Apoorva has researched for Aussie Farms in regards to the Dominion documentary, and she's the editor for Bear Witness Australia, Memoirs of an Investigator. She's also a coordinator with Animal Rights South Australia, a grassroots activism team that engages in vegan education, street outreach and advocacy of local animal rights campaigns here in Adelaide. Could you please give a warm welcome to our poor Brian Thank you very much. Um, so when I think about my relationship with activism, I tend to think about what I did when I became an adult and, and the actions I took. But I want to take you back uh, for a moment to my childhood which is when I think it kind of began. Um, at the age of about six or seven, I learned from my very smug brother at the time that um, the chicken that I was eating was actually the chicken the animal. I had no idea. I actually thought it was just a name. Um, and that changed the way that I looked at a, a lot of things. I found out more about you know, the products that we were eating and the names that they were given. And I stopped because I learned that you didn't actually have to eat animals. So it kind of started for me there. And the only thing that really changed over the years was that I learned more. You know, I learned um, about the dairy industry. I learned about animal testing. I learned about animals being used for clothing. And I guess each time I learned more and I learned that there were alternative ways, I changed my behaviors. Um, and then, of course, I came across the term vegan, which was such an empowering thing to identify with because it, it encapsulated everything about the contradictions that we have with animals, our relationship with animals, the things that I wanted to do for animals. It, it was always there from childhood, um, but this, this term just covered it all. And I share this story with you because I think that this is kind of the essence of veganism. You know, it's not about the, the specifics necessarily. It's not about being perfect in our behavior or or being morally righteous or superior or better than people. It's simply about not exploiting animals and extending those values that we already carry with animals over to our behaviours. Um, and those behaviours can come after the fact. Um, often most of us are philosophically already vegan before we identify with it. And after we identify with it, we keep changing. We keep growing and adapting and learning. It's a constant process, and I think that's what I love about veganism, is that it's not an end point. I, I keep growing as a person. Um, but I guess the, you know, t becoming an activist was, was a bit more prominent when I became older. Um, and I saw the documentary Earthlings, and I was uh, shocked and horrified, and I was like, what can I do about this? And that, that's the difference, I guess, between advocacy and effective advocacy. This is one of the most challenging parts of being an activist, is learning about what's happening to animals, becoming aware of the suffering around the world, and going, what do I do with this information? How do I suddenly take this darkness that I've stumbled upon and put it out to the world so other people can make a change, I can make a change? It's a really overwhelming thing to come across. And it's a really vague role as well. The world doesn't stop for us becoming an activist. And no one kind of turns around and says, here's a bunch of money, go do some activism. It's a really tough thing. So we have to find what works for us. And so this is kind of how I started as an activist. You know, I was finding my feet. I began talking to people. I began actually meeting up with people who were activists and asking, what do you think, what can I do? Um, I joined up with Animals Australia as a volunteer, and that was really valuable because it, it made me realize the far-reaching effects of activism um, on a political policy-changing scale. 
It also got me really used to rejection, which is fantastic, because <laughs> that's a big part of activism, getting used to the fact that people won't necessarily open to you immediately. Um, so it really built my resilience. Um, and then I started a grassroots organisation called Animal Rights South Australia. And we began to... I joined a few people and we realised that we would be more effective as a team. Uh, we brought ideas to the table, we went out onto the streets, we started doing demonstrations, pay-per-views, so you know, showing um, a very powerful video to people on the streets and paying them a dollar to watch it. Um, I then moved into sort of combining my area of interest, which is psychology, with activism, and I studied um, compassion fatigue and trauma in activists in my master's clinical psychology. And so then I thought, well, okay, this is an area that really needs attention. You know, a lot of us are really struggling. Maybe this is something I can bring to the community. And I started to write um, the psychology and veganism blog website, and, and that's kind of where I'm, I'm focusing a lot of my energy now. Um, I, I've done some editing and research. And I, I guess I've worn different hats because I have also been finding my feet in the community and working out what's best for me to do, which is not always easy to work out. In that experience, I've come across a few um, tips that I kind of want to share with you because I know that these are things that had I been told at the very beginning, I would have, I would have really valued that. Um, and hopefully it's something that you might be able to take with you in your activism journey and apply it yourself as well. So to start with, find the role for you that really nurtures your strengths. It's, there's so much to do out there. Um, I think that sometimes we can be exposed to a particular type of activism and think, well, maybe that's what I need to do. You know, maybe I need to be really good at being an influencer, being out there in public and talking to people on the streets. But hey, not everyone's good at that, and that's okay. You don't have to be. Work out what skills you have. Um, spend some time to really look inside and go, what am I good at? And find the roles that nurture that, that really allow that to flourish. Um, secondly, I think this is one of the most um, important uh, techniques, which I, I also wish I came across earlier on, um, and that's turning our motivation into specific action. Now that sounds really simple, but when we, uh, when we get inspired and motivated, we can lose that really quickly. It can fall flat if we don't actually turn that into action. And turning it into action isn't as simple as going, all right, I'm going to get out there. It's about being quite measured and specific. So ask yourself, what am I going to do specifically? What, uh, where am I going to do it? Who am I going to do it with and how am I going to do it? And what step am I going to take what, today? What step am I going to take tomorrow? What's the next step? These specifics can really help us to put it into, into place and make that inspiration into something we can do. Um, learn from your peers. I think that a, a lot of what I've come across and a lot of my development and activism has been um, because of talking, just talking about my activism. Um, if, I lack, uh, if I lack something, a skill, then bring someone else into the picture. Collaborate with people. Um, I really appreciate my partner because I you know, talk his ear off um, about my activism and, and my approaches to it. And you know, be ready to kind of confront yourself as well. Be, be self-critical. It's okay. It's, it's okay to kind of keep developing. Um, and, and I don't necessarily think I always get it right. I, I, and I won't, but that's okay. That's part of the journey. Uh, the other thing I would say is look after yourselves. This is a long haul process. Um, what, a lot of what we're trying to achieve may not happen in our lifetime um, as activists. You know, we want to see a shift in, in the, popul the, the norm in how we look at animals. So sustain yourself. Um, look after your mental health. It's a big part of it. That can be, um, you know, I, I think the term self-care is thrown around a lot, but um, it's, it's a bit more intricate than simply, you know, giving yourself a nice bath while you do some tough work. Um, it's about your relationship with yourself how you talk to yourself and maybe doing the things that you might be avoiding. Um, try not to expose yourself too much to animal cruelty if you're already suffering. Um, and talk to someone you know, if you need to. And that's okay, you can talk to um, a professional, you can seek support and help. You don't have to be at your worst point to do that. There is a massive movement and it, it, the wheel is going to keep on turning, even if you pause, take some time to look after yourself. 
I guess lastly I would say, um, you know, when I first started out as an activist I was a little bit scared and intimidated and then I sometimes still am, um, talking to other people and that's okay. Um, but when I kind of thought of it, when I kept in mind my goal and what was happening to animals, I kind of sometimes would allow that to trump that fear. Um, keep talking to people and remember that this is, this is really important stuff. This isn't petty, this isn't small, this is a very important area of knowledge and if you are um, fortunate enough to have made connections that others haven't, then be that person to help others make connections too. I think the only thing I regret about um, my going vegan was that I didn't learn things sooner. So to be that person for someone else, you know, be that source of information and knowledge for someone else, that teacher that they can aspire to. Um, I think that's it for my end, so thank you very much. Fantastic. I could relate to quite a lot of what you were saying about first of all the chicken, mine was a cow, and then the chicken making those connections that I think probably some of us can relate to. Um, and I love what you said about finding your place and doing the kind of activism that's right for you right now, because that might change over the years. You know, I've been chased by riot police in fields and been outside bigger section lines, and I loved it, but it's not right for me right now, and it's okay to change that. And don't let anybody bully you into saying, unless you do this kind of activism, you're not a proper activist, because that's just rubbish. So I love that. Well, We'll dig in, we're, we're going to have, like I said, we are going to have the, the Q&A and dig into some of these issues after. But have a think about any questions that you might have um, when we get into the Q&A session. So, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, is Linda Stoner. Now, Linda worked as, some of you uh, might recognise Linda from way back in the day. She worked as an actor throughout most of her life, including theatre, musicals, TV shows, that included Young Doctors, Pop Shop, Gludo, The Flying Doctors, Shark's Paradise, and, in my personal opinion, the best ever Australian TV drama, Prisoner. <laughs> Prisoner Cell Block H, as they called it in the UK. I loved it. When I first met Linda, I had no idea. I was just like friends with her. Then all of a sudden I knew, I was like, oh my God, Linda, I saw her in a whole new light. Um, but Linda has actually been an act animal rights activist. She's sort of walked away from her, her acting and, and celebrity uh, career. She's been an animal activist for 46 years, ever since she read Professor Peter Singer's book, Animal Liberation. She's been involved in countless sit-ins and rescues and exposés into the cruelty of battery hen facilities, broiler sheds, pig factories and many more. Linda is currently the CEO of Animal Liberation, which is based in New South Wales, and a director of Animals Australia. Six years ago, she wrote the cookbook, Now Vegan, which was reprinted four times. Now, although she's based in Sydney, Adelaide is actually Linda's hometown, and she's absolutely thrilled to be here. Please give a really warm welcome to Linda Stoner. I can see some lovely people who were here at the breakfast, so if I repeat myself, I do beg your pardon. Um, and Katrina knows me better than I know myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's right. I was about to start a show in Melbourne called Cop Shop, and I'd seen Harp Seal pups being slaughtered on my mum and dad's TV, and while I'd seen a lot of horrible things in my life and, you know, reacted to them in the moment, Something about the Harp Seal Pups just haunted me. I couldn't get it out of my head. So I went back to Melbourne and I did all this research and found out that there were alternatives to, you know, why seals were being clubbed and skinned alive and whales. And it just became an obsession. And so I started working at the Wilderness Society as a volunteer on weekends. And somebody in there said, oh, this book's just come out called Animal Liberation by Professor Peter Singer. And so I, I bought it, and I was in a cab on the way home, first three chapters, and that was it. That was my epiphany. It was like someone had dropped something enormous on my head and heart. And um, so I went home to my little cottage and chucked out all my leather and cosmetics that were tested on animals. And obviously I never ate anyone who swam or flew or walked again. Um, and back in those days, it was odd to be a vegetarian. It was just, people used to um, think that there was something wrong with me. Um, and I used to have stand-up fights. I realize now in hindsight that I probably alienated more people than I converted back in those days because I really was a table-thumping vegetarian. And 
I just didn't get that if I told people about this stuff, why don't they get it? Otherwise, lovely people with big hearts and social consciences. And I, it just was inexplicable to me that they would go on um, participating in this terrible cruelty. So I was floundering in Melbourne. I felt really alienated. And then I met people like Patty Mark um, and Glenna Suges, who's the CEO of Animals Australia, and some really wonderful people. It was a, a small core group. And um, last weekend I was at the Animals Australia AGM and, and it was wonderful because all the oldies were there. And I was just like, oh my God, we're still going. <laughs> we're still alive. <laughs> And because we are so ancient, we <laughs> can look back and, and, and see that things are changing. And I, I said in a talk yesterday that at no other time in the history of the world have so many animals been suffering in their trillions. But on the flip side, at no other time in the history of the world have so many people been fighting for the rights of animals. And I've seen, um, you know, the amount of vegan restaurant. I mean, vegan wasn't a word back then. It really wasn't. <clears throat> and so I've seen the massive increase in veganism and restaurants. And, you know, back in those days, you got a soggy lettuce leaf and a tomato on a plate, you know, if you said you were vegetarian. Now it's just, the world is, I won't finish that sentence. <laughs> the world is our tofu. Um, <laughs> And when people ask me, you know, but what do you eat? It's just like, oh, I have no words because I've got too many words because we have everything at our fingertips. We've got cheese, we've got cream, we've got everything. We've got belts, wallets. There's nothing that a vegan cannot have. And the other thing that, you know, I try to express, if not participating in the chain of cruelty, if that's not going to get to people, then talking about the damage to the planet, like if you're having, if you've got children, if you intend to have children, if you've got kids next door that you give a vague damn about, then how can you continue con to consume dairy and meat, knowing the devastation those things are wreaking on our planet? I just find that um, just <coughs> impossible to understand. And then of course there's the health benefits. So it's it's like a trifecta. I mean, there's nothing wrong about being vegan. So. So I've also seen the change in society back from, um, you know, people saying you're a little bit mad, you're a little bit weird, you're really, really odd, to it's mainstream now, you know, the, that leads, like the mecca for vegans, it's thrilling to come home and see supermarkets and restaurants and all the rest of it here. So when people feel defeated, and we often do, um, or overwhelmed or feel like nothing's ever going to change. It is changing. Philip Wallen said earlier on today that you've still got to keep your eye on the ball, and yes, that's true, but I think we also have to take time to recognise the good things that are happening, to, to dwell on those, because we're all faced with so many ghastly things. It's easy to get overwhelmed, and then you, you can't function anymore. You can't help animals, you can't help anybody. Um, so it's really important to look at the things that are happening in this world, the good things. Um, and I look forward to Q&A after. Thank you very much. People that have been working, like they've been working for decades, because I know sometimes there's this sort of perception that millennials invented veganism. Um, and obviously the young people, that they're doing amazing things, and it's fantastic because I think you've really helped to make it mainstream. But I think it's also important that that's happened as a result of years and years of hard work by amazing activists and particularly amazing female activists. So lovely to share your story, Linda, and we'll get into a, a bit more of that um, when we get into Q&A. So our next speaker is Amy Weir. Amy went vegetarian at the age of 12, largely due to living near Port Adelaide and seeing all the animal trucks heading to the port. She went to her first protest at the age of 15 and she went vegan around 18. She's now 31 and works full-time in a policy and governance role and has studied, worked, volunteered and travelled overseas to many different countries. Amy has a Master of Environmental Management and uses the skills gained in her professional career to volunteer with different grassroots groups such as Adelaide Against Live Export through providing advocacy, written and verbal content, research and strategy in order to increase and support and influence decision makers. 
Amy and her husband run the Vegan Alliance, a not-for-profit project that supports animal charities with 100% of their profits. Please give a warm welcome to Amy Wheeler. Um, thank you, and again, thanks for inviting me. I'm, you know, so grateful to sit up here um, amongst these amazing ladies, and I'm so glad I didn't go first. Um, I'm nowhere near as prepared um, as any of you, <laughs> um, and I might do things a bit different. I might start from this week and then go back um, to the beginning of my life. So I just got back from Bali on Friday night with my husband where we volunteer for an organisation called Villa Kitty. Um, we've been there for about a year and a half now um, and we support them through our label, the Vegan Alliance, so we are donating 100% of proceeds to them um, and also trying to establish them as a charity at the moment in Australia. So that's what I've been working on recently while we're having a break from live export, which has been wonderful. <laughs> um, but. Live export is said to start again from the 1st of November out of Port Adelaide. So if any of you have been to the protests um, recently, thank, thank you very much. And we'll be needing you again very soon. <laughs> um, we thought we thought we had them, but not quite yet. So um, yes, as you said, I do a lot of um, advocacy work and working with policymakers through um, live export. This is something that happened organically and, and naturally, largely because of where I live. So I live next to Port Adelaide, um, and that's always been, I guess, my turning point for vegetarianism and then veganism, um, and something that's just been really close to me for, for my whole life. Um, so a lady called Amanda Allen established Adelaide Against Live Export about five years ago now. It was a one-lady show. She did it all by herself, monitoring the ships before and after work until myself, my husband and Andrew came on board. Um, so now we're a really solid team um, that works tirelessly down at, at Port Adelaide, unfortunately, um, you know, through, through all the months, um, summer, summer and winter. And more recently my role's been, um, I guess, spokesperson. So because it's been in the media so much, um, I've been on the news constantly, which is something I'm not comfortable with at all. I really, I dislike it. Um, I don't like my name being out there, and that's um, one of the main points I wanted to raise today, is that a lot of what I do, I do anonymously. Um, and I do that because I just, I don't have any personal social media. I'm just not interested in um, having my name, my face, or, you know, um, credit, I guess, out there because I think it takes away from the movement in a big way. I think we need to um, stop thinking that we need social media and we need YouTube and our name and stuff out there to make a difference because there are people who are doing so much and they do it anonymously and they do it for our, um, not for credit and not, and not for money. So that's the perspective myself and my husband come from um, and that's how I've always been and, and how I always will be. And I hope I can help um, inspire and empower other women to know that they can be like that as well and be just as effective. Um, so yeah, that's, that's I guess my main mantra and my main guiding principle for the work that I do. Um, so as you said, I do um, written content verbal content and um, investiga investiga investigative <laughs> stuff as well um, for a number of organisations from large to small around Australia and internationally as well. So it's about, as, as you said, Apuva, using your skills, um, finding what your skills are and using them to help others so we don't all have to be doing the same thing. Um, so my husband did a talk here yesterday and he started the AV chapter in Adelaide and I've never attended because I just couldn't imagine anything worse than that. <laughs> I, there's no way I could, um, you know, keep my call talking to the public about an issue so close to my heart. Even though it's been 14, 15 years, I just can't do it. Um, and he's, you know, asked me so many times to come and try. And then I did go once and he said to me, never come back again because <laughs> I just got so angry because of course, of course a farmer showed up. So yeah. Um, that, that anger is something that I haven't been able to get rid of in, or since I was, you know, a child. So 
I think that's okay though. I think that's something that helps me stay motivated and driven and stay on task is just um, the fact that you know there's a constant there's a, a constant um, emergency for animals um, and we have to keep doing something all of us no matter what it is no matter what anyone else thinks we just have to yeah keep motivated and so the people that motivate me are mostly women um, in my life but it's also something that's taken years so lots lots of people have come in and out of my life during this um, I guess volunteering or advocacy journey and not everyone has been good um, that's the other thing is I've had a lot of bad experiences um, volunteering for people for three years fundraising through our side project thousands of dollars and then one day they you know turn around and stab you in the back but rather than let that get us down we just kept kept our eye on the prize which is um, helping animals so I guess that what I'm saying is it's, it's important to be strong and resilient and learn from all those negative experiences and, and keep going. Um, so yeah, I've got a really great support network now that I'm so lucky to have. Um, and mostly, most of those are strong women that really take no shit and teach me how to take no shit <laughs> um, at the same time as being, you know, effective and, and strategic. Um, more recently as well, uh, my support network has grown to be farmers, which is <laughs> something really interesting that me and my husband grapple with. So we've been um, rescuing cats and dogs for a long time here in, here in Mbali, but now we've moved into farm animal rescue just because it just happened. We were in the right place at the right time, and now one of our best mates or best supporters is a sheep farmer, and it's so, it's so odd. <laughs> Um, so we have a 500 kilogram Brahmin steer, his name's Kevin. Um, he was surrendered to us by a farmer while we were working on a project, uh, project with wombats. And he just said to us, the slaughter truck is taking these tomorrow and I can't send Kevin. So you have to take Kevin. And it was so bizarre because he connected with Kevin, he named Kevin, but then there was a hundred others that he, he didn't care about. Um, so, so yeah, we took Kevin, <laughs> um, even though we live in Port Adelaide, so um, we rent land for Kevin, <laughs> um, and yeah, we made everything, we made everything happen to Kevin, for Kevin, because of support of, of others, um, but also because of support from farmers, so the farmer, Luke said yesterday, lent us everything, um, built a fence for Kevin, he's, uh, you know, they brush Kevin, they hug Kevin, it's actually really quite odd because then they go and kill their own animals. So, but <laughs> we're, we're trying to work you know, with them to change their mindset over time. Um, and the same thing happened in Bali last week. Um, we stay with a family who are pig farmers and we didn't know that the first time we stayed with them, but then we made the conscious de decision to keep staying with them so they got money from us and then that they could maybe supplement you know, that income that they were getting from the pigs by our money from, from staying there and eventually over a year and a half that happened um, so now they're committed to no longer pig farming and they had two pigs left which they've surrendered to us as well so now we rent land in Bali for these two pigs um, <laughs> um, so yeah um, each time we have a miniature pony as well um, so yeah, each time this happens, we say no more animals, you know, we, this is ridiculous. We now have three properties, but um, this is just what happens. Um, you know, we're in the right place at the right time and people come together and, you know, this all happens for a reason, I guess. I don't really believe in that kind of thing, but it just, it just happens and it's hard work and, you know, there's people in this room that are so supportive to us. Um, so yeah, I just... I didn't tell you back to like where I started. I didn't get that far, but it's already been too long. So yeah. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> what else? Um, yeah, so just, I guess I didn't find my feet until about five years ago. And that's when I met my husband as well. Um, and we just have, we're a strong team, but we're also complementary because we disagree. And I think that's really important. Um, my, my professional job is to be critical. I do contract management and policy and governance and my job is to tell people they're not doing things right and here's how they can do it better. And I think that's something that's so important in this movement and I hope people will do that to me as well, which my husband definitely does, you know. He tells me, no, that's a stupid idea, you know, that's ridiculous. No, we can't make that happen. Not, not in those words, but... <laughs> Sometimes. 
Um, and my friends do that too, and I expect that from them. Um, and and you know that I can do that as well. So that kind of 360 degree feedback and criticism, I think, is so important. And we need to take ego out of this movement entirely, so that that can happen and we can be effective um, for animals. Amy, I just want to pick up on one thing you said because obviously as someone who's a journalist who's worked in media for 18 years and encourages people, including activists, to get in front of the media, I just want to address your point there about, like, to make it get, it's not right for everyone. If you're not comfortable being in front of the media, if you're not comfortable having social media uh, profiles, that's totally cool and the type of activism you do is wonderful and you're right, there are loads, there are probably heaps more people doing activism anonymously, which is fantastic. However, I think we also do need people who are happy. So if you are part of a group, find someone who, that's their comfort zone. Like a porker said, find where your, your skill set is. If you're a, an influencer, like we've got Carly coming and joining the panel, who's a big Instagram influencer, same as Jane. We, I think we do need that so that they're getting out that information that's often being uh, found by you know, activists doing this work anonymously. So we're literally kind of working as a whole and as a team. But yeah, absolutely, if it's not your comfort zone, don't do it, because certainly with me, Media, you don't you, you want someone who is really happy to do it they're willing to do it and they'll, they'll learn the skills to do it otherwise it, it can be uh, more damaging if not so but yeah find your comfort zone but that's great thank you so much for sharing your story Amy so our final speaker before we go into Q&A and invite Carly up uh, is Louise Pfeiffer now Louise has been vegan since 2011 and she seeks to use her business skills to help the animals Joining the Animal Justice Party in 2017, Louise has now found a way to apply her marketing negotiations and public speaking skills to help grow the party and in turn help the animals. Louise ran as a candidate in the 2018 South Australia state election, presented at community forums, wrote articles that were published in the local newspapers, and was interviewed on the radio. So here's someone who does like media. <laughs> Louise was also able to apply her business training to help lead the digital marketing campaign uh, for the uh, Animal Justice Party's campaign. Louise was proud to be part of a strong and passionate team that helped the party achieve its record-breaking result, and she's eager to keep helping the animals through building leverage in the political system. Please welcome Louise Pfeiffer. Um, I'd just like to start by thanking my fe fellow panellists, Linda, Borba and Amy, um, and Katrina for them seeing, <clears throat> and to Cathy for bringing the Plant Power Women concept to Adelaide. Mm -hmm. uh, and just like to also thank, thank the vegan festival organisers, and in particular Lee McBride, who with her tireless work has brought this world class, ranked number one festival to our city. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is my journey after embarking on an ethical life, the concept of effective altruism and doing the most good, and why I think politics is the next frontier for the animal rights movement, and have chosen politics as my way of contributing to the most important social justice movement of our time. My journey began in 1995 when I studied ethics at the University of Adelaide as part of my Bachelor of Arts. I actually majored in um, psychology and minored in philosophy. Peter Singer's book, Practical Ethics, was the main text for the course, and Animal Liberation, uh, his seminal book, is still relevant today, uh, and it was on the reading list. On reading um, Animal Liberation, I had one of those aha moments, as a lot of us have had, um, on learning on how much the animals suffer, and I realised that um, all along I thought it was wrong, like most of us did, but now I knew why. It's because they suffer. I became vegetarian and stopped eating meat, stopping short of veganism due to societal pressure, promising myself that I would one day become vegan. I learned around, about a range of other ethical issues and a, a sense of social justice was instilled in me. I knew I wanted to make the world a better place, but I wasn't sure um, yet when or how. So for the next 15 years, I established a career in financial services undertook postgraduate studies, including a master's degree in business, business administration, and made a lot of money. Becoming vegan was pushed further and further to the back of my mind. I worked hard and was on my way to the C-suite, developing strong marketing, negotiations, influencing, and social skills along the way, when something happened. I met a lovely man named Phil, and we were thrilled to be expecting our first child in 2010. In early 2011, I was nursing my six-month-old baby. The television was on in the background. 
The 7pm project, as it was called at the time, had a special on bobby calves and how animal activists were lobbying for their rights not to be starved in the days leading up to their slaughter. The segment explained what bobby calves were, an unwanted product of the dairy industry, and that some 700,000 baby cows in this country each year were taken from their mothers and sent to slaughter, also that we could drink milk and eat cheese. <coughs> Despite having learned this many years, uh, many years ago at university, I was horrified. And as a mother, I could now feel and empathise with these poor dairy cows. I had nightmares for days afterwards, um, but someone took my baby from me, and despite searching, I couldn't find him. The only logical and compassionate thing to do was to become vegan. I dusted off my copy of Animal, Liber uh, Animal um, Liberation that had moved with me and been on my bookshelf for 15 years. Reread what was there all along, and we became a vegan family. <laughs> it is often said that having a child is a life-changing experience, and for me this was both literally and metaphorically true. A, sh a shift in consciousness had taken place. That very same year I read a more recently published book of Peter Singer's called The Life You Can Save. The Life You Can Save is an extension of Peter's essay from the 1970s called Famine, Morality and Affluence, and argues that affluent persons are morally obligated to donate far more resources to humanitarian causes than is considered normal in our culture. He argues that in a world where one billion people are living on less than $2 per day, and that's after adjusting for purchasing power parity, that um, those of us in wealthy countries uh, should be doing more to help individuals that, as individuals to help those in need. Some 16,000 children die every single day on this planet from preventable causes, and donating to charities who are doing work to prevent this is one of many ways that we can do good. He points to research by an organisation called Give Well, which was started up by a couple of ex-hedge fund traders who wanted to find research and analytics to help them make decisions on how to spend their money to help uh, to, to make the world a better place. GiveWell uses robust methodology to assess charities and shows how the most effective charities can be many thousand times more effective than others. His book touches on a new movement called Effective Altruism, which has grown exponentially in size since 2011, when I first learned about it. Effective Altruism is a philosophy and social movement that uses evidence and reason to determine the most effective ways to benefit others. It encourages individuals to consider all causes and actions and to act in a way that brings about the greatest positive impact to use both the heart and the head. As an expert in financial investments and portfolio construction and how to maximise investment returns, the concept of effective altruism resonated with me. If you want to do good, why not um, design things so that you do the most good by using research? There are many organisations that sit under the effective altruism umbrella, and one that has influenced my career, past the most is called 80,000 hours. 80,000 hours is so named because that's the approximate number of working hours that we will have in our professional lives. Um, 80,000 hours provides free information and research to help you find a fulfilling, high impact career. Make the right career choices and you can help solve the world's most pressing problems, factory farming being one of them, all while having a more rewarding and interesting life. It's an excellent free resource on how to do the most good with your working life, and I highly suggest having a look at it if, if, um, to see what they, what they talk about. Now, one of the career paths that they uh, suggest, particularly suited to those partway through their career, as I was at the time, is called earning to give. This means deliberately choosing a high-paid job and giving even larger amounts of money to effective charities. This is distinct from entering into a job with direct impact, such as becoming an aid worker or entering into a role with a non-profit. For me, partway through my career at the time, earning to give felt right. As such, since 2011, our family's focus was earning to give, giving at first 5% of our household income to the most effective charities, uh, building to 10%. Each year reassessing which charity would receive our hard-earned money um, by using the available research. Uh, we as a family were living more purposeful lives, and I also volunteered with non-profits, attended activist rallies, obtained a certificate in plant-based nutrition, and continued to learn more about veganism, including the health, environmental, and psychological benefits of adopting a plant-based diet. We brought our children up vegan and tried to be role models for the vegan movement in Melbourne, and then in Adelaide when we moved back in 2015. 
I remember being excited in 2016 when the Chinese government announced a, a plan and a policy to halve meat consumption, um, you know, a very large population by 2030 for environmental and health reasons. But last year, my excitement turned to frustration. Our government um, was silent about the impacts animal agriculture has on our environment and on the planet that my two children were now living on. Things started to change for me. On my daily commute to work from the hills down to Glen Osmond Road, I almost always saw a truck full of animals on their way to slaughter. And it was a continual reminder of their never-ending suffering. Despite specialising in advising clients on ethical investing, I was feeling restless and started to wonder whether my skills and abilities were being used in the best way to reduce the amount of suffering in the world. I revisited the 80,000 Hours website and looked at other careers that had high levels of direct impact and um, high advocacy potential. Uh, tech startup founder, no, not my thing. Becoming a journalist, uh, no, didn't want to go back to university. Uh, party politics, like, wait, what? Politics? I recall the many conversations I've had with my husband, Phil, over the years about politics, and they were something like this. Um, Phil, did you watch Insiders on ABC this morning, Louise? Isn't it interesting that, and all of you was like um, kissing Barnum playing in my head. Um, yeah, what? My view on politics as a conversation topic was one that was beyond apathy. I had zero interest in politics and found it utterly boring, beyond boring. But for some reason, I kept revisiting the party politics section at the 80,000 Hours website. It said, this could be a good fit for you if you have strong social skills, ability to toe the party line, uh, be able to withstand press scrutiny. I ticked some of the boxes, but was really interested to learn more why, about why politics was rated the top career path for direct impact. My layperson interpretation of their very lengthy career review is that if you want to change the system, the very system that not only enables legal animal cruelty, but subsidises it, then you have to infiltrate the system. To influence government policy, decisions on legislation and how to spend large amounts of money, you need to be in the room when decisions get made. Let's talk about power for a moment. So street activism reaches everyday people one at a time, those with the individual power to change their own personal, consumer and voting behaviour. A complementary strategy is to target people who have the mandate to change the behaviour of many people at, of many people at once such as those in the many tiers of government, those who write the laws and regulations. So attempting to influence people in positions of power is called political lobbying, a strategy which a lot of organisations employ because of its high impact. However, powerful people, i.e. the politicians, are not often open to our message, they don't see the world as we do. Therefore, a strategy to guarantee that powerful people are open to our message is to become them ourselves. This means forming or joining a political party or group. Convinced at this very vegan festival last year, I approached the two political parties who had stalls, the Greens Party and the Animal Justice Party. I asked about their respective policies and the three issues of utmost importance to me, the animals, the environment and humanitarian issues. I like the Greens for their stand against the major parties on their uh, inhumane treatment of refugees but was ultimately drawn to the Animal Justice Party for their solidarity with the Greens on this issue, but primarily for their recognition of animal agriculture's significant role in the wholesale destruction of our environment. I was also impressed with the Animal Justice Party due to the fact they have an explicit goal to take animals out of the food system. I joined the Animal Justice Party and over the last year thrown myself into politics, volunteering where I could, helping with marketing and strategy, going to meetings. My first real taste of politics was when I ran as a uh, candidate in the state election um, earlier this year. I ran in the seat of Carvel, up to the Adelaide Hills where I live. It was an incredible experience and I learned a lot, not only from the people I spoke to during the campaign, but also from the very talented and capable plant power women and men of the Animal Justice Party, and of course the other candidates. Our result was remarkable, as Katrina mentioned. We tripled our first preference vote at this state election uh, from the previous state election. There were other highlights, such as being invited to speak at a candidate forum in Harndorf, which was convened by a cattle farming lobby group, promoting the party and veganism through media and radio during the election campaign, <coughs> lobbying with other members of the Animal Justice Party with elected representatives to have a ban on duck shooting legislated. After the election, I was invited to write an ongoing monthly article in the Hills Weekend Herald, where I can write about animal-related issues unfettered. My articles appear alongside Senator Corey Bernardi's, leader of the Australian Conservatives, and Georgina Downer, the pre-selected Liberal candidate for Mayo.
and reach tens of thousands of people in the Adelaide Hills who aren't on social media. Politics for the animals is taking off around the world. Political parties in Portugal, UK and the Netherlands have elected officials in many tiers of government. And in Australia, uh, since 2015, the Honourable Mark Pearson from the Animal Justice Party was elected as a legislative councillor, a senator in the Upper House in the New South Wales State Government. We are confident as a party that there will be more state senators elected in the upcoming New South Wales and Victorian elections. More animal advocates in the room where decisions get made, just as Mark Pearson is, can and will reduce animal suffering. After a year of hard work for the party at both a state and federal level, I'm convinced that politics matches my skills with my purpose. Today I am thrilled yet utterly humbled to announce to you that I've been pre-selected by the Animal Justice Party to be the state's lead candidate for the Senate at the upcoming federal election. There is no better use of my skills uh, to lobby government to change the law in favour of the animals or to use my negotiating skills to influence the other 75 senators if elected. But to be elected, I will need all of you, your friends and their friends to vote number one for me come ele Federal Election Day. Yeah. <laughs> my journey to politics has been one of applying ethics, rationality and passion, born from a desire to make the world a better place. To learn more about how you can solve the world's most pressing problems, I tease your heart and your head, I encourage you to visit the 80,000 Hours website and the Centre for Effective Altruism website. I can think of no better career path for me, and I no longer feel powerless to change things for the better. I'm excited for the future, for the pressure being placed on the system by so many hard-working people, and pledge to give the best parts of myself as service to the animals, to alleviate their suffering in the best ways I know how. To finish, to help the animals, to rally against the status quo, to break the system that enables their abuse. We need to be collectively be methodical, organised, strategic. And I believe we each need to think carefully about what our special talents are, what our skills are, to find the best fit and keep building our current advocacy, activists and political efforts. The animals, our health as a species and our very planet depend on it. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Louise. How heartening is it, particularly in this time where we're seeing some awful things happening in politics, the move to the far right, and very disturbing. It's really heartening to, to have someone like Louise, with, especially with your background, you know, in finance, people, you know, rightly or wrongly, they sometimes listen to more people with that so-called background, like Phil Wallen, who gets to speak with, you know, he spoke at the European Parliament recently, he has very high profile, he gets access to kind of, like you say, the people in power, high profile people. Um, and I think, uh, how inspiring is it? I hope you, you really are feeling inspired by the diversity of the different way and the many different ways you can do activism. There's no one right or wrong way. We need absolutely all of it, uh, which I think is wonderful. So I hope this is inspiring you and you're getting your thinking caps on to say, right, how can I do, how can I use my skills and, uh, to help animals, which is wonderful. So please give a, a warm round of applause for our speakers so far. Now I'd like to invite to the stage now for our Q&A, uh, Carly Taylor, come up and join us, Carly. Yeah, so I'll just get out, do a little intro for, for Carly. So Carly is a passionate animal rights activist and environmentalist, originally from Toronto in Canada. After studying biology and psychology in her undergrad, she now travels around the world with her partner, James Aspie, organising activism events and speeches, and creating online content to help spread the vegan message and to inspire people to live more consciously. And you can find Carly on her Instagram at carlytaylor269. Welcome to the panel, Carly. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> Wonderful. So we're going to open it out to a Q&A shortly, but there's one thing I... Uh, I was listening to all of you talking, and I think this is a, quite an important topic, so I'd love to get kind of your, your take on it. And uh, the reason I, I mentioned earlier that Kathy's created the space for, for vegan women, for plant-powered women to have a safe space, or for there to now be a change, and obviously with the creation of online and social media, that's made a big difference. We're able to uh, break the stereotypes of what vegan food is, about what veganism is. Um, so what can we do differently, Carly? I mean, would you like to chip in there? But I think one of today's technologies that we can all be utilizing more effectively is social media. Um, and I, for, for the first time in this last decade, we all have a platform on our phones. Almost all of us um, have at least our friends and family on our social media. 
So when you really think about that, let, let's say the, the average is even 50 people following you on Facebook or on Instagram. That's 50 people in front of you if you, if you, if you visualize it that way who are listening to what you're saying every day. So I think it's a really powerful opportunity to be strategic about it and not just use it as a platform to talk about the causes that are important to you because you need to think about the psychology of the people listening to it. And if they're not vegan, then you know it's gonna be very easy for them to just stop watching your stuff if it's just that. But if you think about the audience that you're trying to, att uh, uh, to attract on Facebook or, so uh, or Instagram or YouTube, or if it's even just your friends and family and you know that they like watching stuff where it's what you're up to every day, or if you're traveling, it's some of your travel highlights and also the vegan activism we did in there. And I think that we all have, whether or not you have a big platform or not, we all have a really powerful opportunity right now to be spreading so many more seeds than we are that can then be spreading their own seeds, right? So when you think of it more as like an exponential growth thing that social media is allowing us to talk to so many people at once, and even if it sticks with a fraction of those people, then those people are going to be talking to so many people at once. So I really think that whether or not you're comfortable on camera, whether or not you want to dedicate um, time to starting a YouTube channel, even if you start small with starting to, to repost some articles on Facebook that you've seen from your vegan friends, or if you've never really posted vegan content on Instagram, start posting the vegan meals that you're eating that look especially good to just start planting those seeds in people that aren't really there yet, that are following you. We should all be using social media. It is, it is part of today's technology that I think can can take social justice movements to another level because of how fast the information can spread. So don't be afraid of it. There's not, I, I know that we kind of started off talking about social media on a bit of a negative foot with the criticism that you might get, but it doesn't matter because the, the impact that you can have and the amount of people that you can reach with a powerful message nowadays is just unparalleled. So every single one of us should be using the platforms that we feel like getting involved in, uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube to start with, um, and just, and just doing your own thing on it. It doesn't have to be similar to what everyone else is doing, um, but I think that we should all be using social media, and I think that we should all be using it strategically in terms of mixing it with non-vegan content that will draw on the audience that we have in mind to, to watch our content. So yeah. all of us can, can start doing that. It's a great answer, because you've got to remember, you never know when people are going to change. I've had people come up to me that say, oh, I've been following you on Facebook for years, and I've read your articles, and I've been, I'm vegan now, and I'm like, yes! Well, that's like the best thing that they can say, we never know. They might not do it straight away, but they're taking it in. They might be just lurking. They might not comment, they might not like, but they will lurk. Uh, and it can have an impact, and it's amazing. And trying to educate them that actually, the, you know, it's obviously a taste of food that we can all eat, but also, um, like the species is like, obviously, um, you know, putting all, like, so much money into um, treating dogs and cats and small animals, and then we have a lot of um, people bring in a lot of wildlife, and it's not, you know, not necessarily, we're unable to treat it, but kind of the expectation as to what to do. Anyone like to comment on that? It's not the industry, I know much of them, so. I don't want to take over, it's just that I've had, you know, some direct experience lately with our cow and also our pony. Um, and yeah, birds that we found as well. I'm lucky that I have a vegan equine vet. Um, it's pretty rare, I think. Um, and her level of care is outstanding and the fact that I know she can advocate from a vegan level for all, you know, she's not just an equine vet, but all farmed animals um, is pretty amazing. And I can give you her contact details if you like. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something we've come up against when we rescued birds. Um, in fact, we rescued a lorikeet here yesterday. Um, somebody took them around to three different stores and nobody knew what to do. Um, so it's, it's again about educating and upskilling, like maybe suggest they take a wildlife course because they're available. Um, and obviously the dogs and cats make money. <laughs> um, but I think it's important if they advertise that, if your clinic advertised that they're a vet that is sympathetic and, you know, available to help with that kind of thing, they'd get extra customers from that anyway. A lot to do with like, you know, not many of the staff, like I'm in a minority and I, and I really struggle to actually 
you know, when I speak to the other staff members, they just, you know, we're saving some animals in the morning, we're putting all this money into, you know, like, um, rescue and, and, you know, treating some animals. And then in the staff room in the afternoon, people are just, you know, like eating ham sandwiches or chicken salads and things like that, and it's just, like, awesome, really. Linda, did you want to say something? Um, I think that the rot often starts with vets when they're training because they use living animals to train on and um, the first person to step aside from that was um, a guy called Andrew Knight in Western Australia. He stood up to Murdoch University and it was the most courageous thing. He just would, refused and he was allowed to, after a long battle and a court case, might I add, um, use simulations, um, but the rest of the vet students were all using animals. Um, and then there was a young woman called, there is a young woman called Lucy Fish in New South Wales. She took on Sydney University and she refused to use living animals to test on, uh, to become a vet. So I think that as long as vets train using living animals um, and killing them, then there's going to be a disconnect from, um, you know, caring about all animals. just wanted to add to that. Um, I think the, the norm at the moment is uh, something that's called carnism, which is, it's a term that was coined by psychologist Dr. Melanie Julian. It explains um, the belief system, the sort of invisible belief system that we're all grown up with in our society and culture about how, you know, um, animals are okay to eat and, and use and da 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 in this way. But that doesn't necessarily mean our relationship with animals directly changes. So you've still got a lot of people who are who love animals, and that's why they become vets. Um, but still, very much believe that there are animals that should be eaten and used. And I think it can be disillusioning for us because we we make a very direct correlation. We go, okay, there's an animal here. How are you not making that connection? Um, but they are just like everyone else. You know, everyone else who says I'm an animal lover. A lot of people tell us that they're animal lovers, and you know, I don't doubt them. I actually do believe them. I believe that you're an animal lover and you care about animals, but you are part of this belief system that you haven't quite yet understood. And I think that when we start to understand that you know, psychology behind why we use animals, we have such a contradictory relationship with animals, um, that's going to change over time. And people are going to start making that connection. We're already seeing it happen in the health industry, like lots more medical professionals, medical doctors, like the PCRM, Physicians Committee for Response Medicine, they had a thousand of their doctors outside Washington with a great big banner saying, go vegan for your health. And I think that will hopefully start to happen in that industry. It's going to be people like you who, and Andrew Knight who are going to push that change. Just very quickly for you personally, there is a group, I think it's a Facebook group, Vegan Veterinarians, so you're not the only one. Uh, it might be worth just joining them and making some connections. Louise, did you want to quickly I just wanted to add about the book that you're referring to, about um, the Melanie Joy book. Uh, it's called Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs and Wear Cows, where she talks about carnism in great detail. For me, that changed uh, me from a kind of angry, frustrated vegan to having a much better understanding of uh, the people around me that still ate meat. So I highly recommend that book. And also there's one by Claire Mann that came out as well. Yeah, which is yeah, how to cope with the anguish of being vegan in a non-vegan world. Yeah. Carly, did you want to add anything on that for us? Not this one? Okay. I think it is. It's like we've got to remember as well, like when we weren't vegan. I think for those of us who've been vegan longer, like I've been vegan 21 years, I think Linda's been vegan longest, we sometimes forget. Like I was vegetarian, I went vegetarian when I was 11, but I still wore leather. I still wore, and I ate vegetarian cheese. And I thought, oh, I'm doing it right. I'm really, you know, cool. we forget that, you know, we had that belief. I thought there's nothing wrong with leather, it's just a bike blah, blah, blah. And then when you find out, I remember being horrified in the mid 90s when this lovely school teacher said to me she was a vegan and I offered her my Marmite and cheese sandwich. I said, it's vegetarian cheese, we're on our way to a demo. And she said, oh no, and then she explained the dairy industry and my jaw dropped. I thought, how could I not know? I'm like, I'm a feminist, because I immediately made those connections, you know, babies being stolen, hijacking a female reproductive system. My jaw dropped, I beat myself up for a good while. I can tell you thinking, how did I not know that? How could I be so stupid? How can I be so blind? Um, so I think we have to kind of Cut, I guess cut other people some slack while still advocating and educating.